put yourselves on mute for now. Um, there is an opportunity to ask questions at the end. So, or put them in the chat box at the bottom and we can answer them at the end for you. Bit of housekeeping, if you want to take your camera off, you certainly can, but it's quite nice to be able to see people completely up to yourselves. Um, we might have a few more people join us as we go along. You can do different views as well. You can have speaker view where when Jane's talking, she comes up as the main person, or you can have it in a view where you can see everybody, which is what I use because I quite like, I feel, get a feeling of being part of a meeting. Um, so thanks for joining us all. I'm Debbie. Hopefully you know me by now. Um, it's great to have so many of you this early on in the year as well, actually. How lovely. So Kroisa, welcome everybody. Um, the, this session is going to be recorded, so it will be available on the Tubby Cymru Knowledge Hub afterwards. So you can um, go back on if you think there's something you need to, to kind of revisit. So please do. Um, we, as you know, offer all of these workshops, sessions, one-to-one -one advice and support, 100% funding. You just need to be registered through completing the online business review, which all of you will have done actually because you're here, um, so that's great. If there's any feedback in terms of other sessions that you would like to see, please do email me because the only way we can make this sector led is by your feedback really, so that's really helpful for me. The reason that we have got Jane is because of your feedback actually, because quite a few people said that they'd like to look at extending the season, so that's dead helpful. Um, so without further ado, Jane Hutchin runs Hay Lane Flowers, which is a three acre cut flower farm in Bedfordshire, selling flowers to wholesale and retail markets. This session, as I say, was from feedback and it's to explore extending the season um, and looking at methods of extending the season of cut flower production. Um, we're due to run for about an hour. There's opportunity for questions at the end. As I say, put them in the chat box or save it to the end and then you can ask the question directly yourself. So I'm going to pass you over to Jay. Can I ask quickly, how do we find the chat box? So if you hover your mouse at the bottom. I don't have a mouse. Oh, <laughs> if sorry. You, you I'm should... on an iPad. Oh, right. OK, so you should at the bottom of your screen, if you've got your mute box and your stop your video yeah. and that kind of stuff. Along yeah. there, there should be something that says chat on that same. No. Strip. Oh, yes, I've got it. Yeah. So in there, if you just put your finger on that, you should be able to type in your questions in there. Thank you. All right, Fran. I'll put myself on mute. Anything, Jane, just give us a shout. Thank you. Right. Um... Well, hello everybody. And if you do have a question, don't worry, because there will be time at the end as well. So if you don't get a chance to type it in the chat box or anything, just jot it down or keep it in your head and we'll have a chance to ask questions at the end as well. Um, so yeah, I'm like Debbie said, I'm Jane. I'm based in East Anglia on the flower farm here. Um, I know a few of your names from Flowers from the Farm because I'm the East Anglian coordinator for Flowers from the Farm. And I think I might know one of you from the diversity action group as well, because I look at um, diversity within flowers from the farm as well. Uh, been growing full time. Hmm. Well, this is a tricky one. My family are flower farmers. And so that's how I originally started off. But when I had my children back in uh, the 90s, childcare wasn't what it was, what it is now. And I decided because I didn't want to put my children into full time childcare, I wanted to raise them myself. So I retrained as a teacher, went off and taught until my kids graduated from uni and then went back into the family business and started the flower farm up again two years ago here at the new site, at the Hay Lane site. Um, and flower farming has changed immensely in that time period when my parents ran their flower farm it was very much a commercial operation very large scale growing only five six crops a year cutting thousands of blooms sending off to first of all my mother's florist shop in which was a busy town center shop but anything excess was sent to markets at Spalding for wholesale sale and when I've come back into it, I've discovered there is a huge uh, flowers from the farm movement with a lot of artisan growers growing, 
60 different plants, 60 different crops, um, which is what I now focus on because it suits my location. I'm in quite an affluent commuter belt area where people will spend money on flowers, where I have a lot of independent artisan florists who want um, blooms. And then I suddenly realized that in my area, we've got five other, in my county, there are five other flower farmers all doing the same thing. They're all growing 60 different flowers, they're all growing dahlias, they're all growing sweet peas, they're all growing roses, they're all growing larkspur and ami and dill and selling them to independent florists. And then they all stop in October and then they all restart again the next April. Well, some of them don't even grow tulips, so they don't start till May. And then the florists are all like, well, what do I do now? I go back to my Dutch growers and I thought, well, this is no good. My florists really, really, really want to have British grown flowers throughout the winter. And I've spoken to a lot of them and a lot of them really don't mind that they might have to adapt the way they think about flowers to and what their bouquets will look like to see what we can provide them with and what we can grow them with. So I've now started growing for 12 months of the year and supplying florists for 12 months of the year. And hopefully I'll be able to show you a little bit of what I do and also talk about things that you might be able to do depending on the conditions that you've got for growing. OK, so what I'd like to do is I would like to just I've lost my PowerPoint. I would like to share a PowerPoint with you that I've prepared. Here it is. And we'll talk through it as we go. And you'll have that available for you as well afterwards so let me know if you can see this okay can we give me a thumbs up if you can see the powerpoint that i've got up on the screen awesome thank you guys so we're going to talk about different ways you can extend the season it will be different for different people depending on what facilities you've got where you're located and mainly what your customers what your customer base is um ignore this first slide because this was written at the start of december and it says from the first of january we're going to have an eight percent tariff on imported flowers we didn't come out with no deal we came out with a deal so that is no longer true and at the moment what this means for imported flowers we're not entirely sure there's been lots of disruption but a lot of this disruption is due to covid and shipping as much as brexit so we are still waiting to see how that's going to affect um, the import of Dutch flowers and flowers from further afield like Kenya. Okay, we have a lot of new growers joining the ranks and many of them are doing it on such a small scale that they're just producing a few buckets a week of flowers. But it's still something to think about you, how many people you're com competing with in your area and what they are growing but as I've said before they're mostly just growing between April and October leaving a gap in the market between um, October and April next slide Come on. there we go um, so there's two ways we extend the season here one's reasonably easy but time consuming because if you choose varieties that naturally bloom in the winter months then they're not that much effort to grow, but they can be quite expensive to set up with, to purchase. And it takes quite a lot of planning um, to get them in and up and running. Or you can provide the artificial conditions, forcing bulbs um, and such, which is brilliant, works really well, but you do need to have heat polytunnels or conditions to do that. Whichever way you do it, it's quite costly to set up. Um, around here, what I'm doing is we're putting in an awful lot of shrubs, an awful lot of evergreens, an awful lot of winter flowering shrubs and perennials. And we won't be able to harvest many of those for a couple of years at least. So you've got to have a really clear plan of how your business is developing. Are you staying where you are? Are you on your site? For the next five years or so and that and also that does take quite an in, 
huge initial investment to buy, say, 100 eucalyptus trees and the weed control fabric to get them planted and with no reward in the first three years at all, probably, for that. OK, so you have to think about that. But then once you've got them, you've got them forever, haven't you? So after that, it's just a matter of maintaining them and you've got them. But if you're going to invest, there's a lot of points you need to think about. So first of all, um, visit your local gardens, see what's growing in the winter, uh, what's it's your area, your soil types. Um, a lot of people don't realise what flowers are growing. So if you have a look at what British wholesalers are selling, then you can get an idea about perhaps things that you could sell as well. So Clowance, New Covent Garden, um, BJ Richards, people like that put out a mailing list and you can see what they're selling. So is, is there a gap in the market for you? Uh, the most important thing is who you're selling to. So I'm pretty lucky with my location here. I am supplying a lot of artists and florists. I've got three retail outlets here. Only um, one of them has been allowed to stay open through lockdown though as there are grocers, the others have been shut through lockdown. So that's been a bit of a pain, but um, everything I'm selling is very much um, artisan bouquets and artisan buckets for weddings and things like that. I'm no longer wholesaling on a large scale, but if you're wholesaling on a large scale, then the world's your oyster really, because you can plant a field of eucalyptus, um, a whole polytunnel of forced narcissi, uh, and that makes it a lot easier in the long run because you're just concentrating on one or two crops at a time. Okay, um, another good thing, like I said, I always talk with my customers to see what they want. My florists are very keen on asking me for what I can grow for them. Um, and the other thing about talking to customers is, is educating them about what you are able to supply them with as well, because when people um, ask me for flowers, they don't expect me to say, I'm really sorry, I can't do those for you, but I can do this because they're so used to going to a Dutch wholesaler and getting exactly what they've asked for, okay? So it's a really good idea to have a chat with your customers and show them examples of what you can produce for them. Um, so most of you will be familiar with Claire Brown's British Flowers book. Again, that's a really good, thing to have a look at because most of my florists have that book and that's what they will use with wedding consultations and so that they're the type of flowers they're looking to buy so if we have a look at what flowers um claire says in her book are available in january you've got paper white narcissi snowdrops astromeria by burnham winter box british forum and hellebore there's a few other things but they're the main ones there so I'm just going to go through and see which ones I grow and which ones I don't and why. OK, so paper whites. Yes, an absolute must for me. Really easy. Can grow them in crates, can grow them in the ground, can grow them potted up for customers. Very easy to force. And it's not just paper whites. Uh, paper whites are what Claire mentions in the book, but it's any narcissi are suitable for forcing um, and some are really easy like the paper whites and the tazetta nuts, I said like sold doors and things. They're very easy for forcing so they're an absolute must. Snowdrops, no. I don't grow them because there's no market for them around here. I could perhaps um, shift a few basketfuls of small ones but they're quite expensive. They're quite, um, they take quite a while to establish. Um, for me, they're just not a good, good one to grow. Um, Alstroemeria, I do grow Astromeria, but I do not have heat and I do not have light, so I don't have them at this time of the year, but I do have a really long season for them in the polytunnel harvesting right through to November. I'm, I'm hoping to start again with those in April. Viburnum, yes, definitely. It's outdoors, it's a shrub, it's evergreen. It's fantastic and indispensable in Christmas work and you can get a good stem length if you train it properly. So it's fantastic for winter bouquets. Uh, the winter box, I do not grow because it's expensive and it doesn't like my soil. Okay, but it might well work where you are. Pittosporum, nope, I do not grow because we are in a frost pocket and 
I wish I could grow it. It's one of the things I would really love to have, but it's not hardy in our area, so I can't grow it. But if you can grow Pittosporum, please do, because it sells like hotcakes. Um, and hellebore, yes, I do, because I have an artisan market and they love hellebores. And that's easy and it doesn't mind the cold in my area. So let's have a look at the first method of extending your seeds and what can you get into flower from January through to April. I'm just going to go quickly through the varieties and the ones we grow and a few that we don't that might succeed for you if you've got the right sort of area. Okay, like Narcissa. Well, I love them because they're the earliest growing thing that flowers naturally earliest on our farm. But they're cheap and cheerful when um, the season is in full flow. And supermarkets really do sell them for, I, can't, I just cannot believe how little they can sell them for and how little our Cornish growers must be getting for their Narcissi for how much the supermarkets are selling them for. So you can buy some varieties that will flower super early. So I've listed a few there. Um, well worth, if you're going to invest in a Narcissi, why not just invest in Narcissi that flower super early so you can get ahead. Grow some of main season ones as well, but I would always include a couple of different varieties, one of the pale colours, one of the yellow colours, for very early on in the season because you can get them in, in flowering from February especially if you've got a sunny bank or something on your farm you could plant it with those and then you could naturally with no hassle and no problem get some early blooms from February onwards okay um, and you can grow them in the polytunnel as well just to give yourself a little bit of earlier cropping and you can force them and we'll come back to that later but at the moment we're just looking at variety selection um, and as I've said, profit lies in bulk production. So being able to get a load out to your local wholesale or your hub or artisan marketing techniques, which is kind of what we were talking about earlier when we were looking at Aunt Sarah Raven's seed packets. Pretty aunt, isn't David Austin got a wonderful book? Yes, he has. But you can have that too. And if you, um, my Narcissi, when I market to the general public around here, I market them as heirloom dafts and heirloom narcissi and there's always something special about them um, to make people want to buy my ones rather than the a pound a bunch supermarket ones. Okay, so you've got to give yourself an edge that way. And I would hope that your independent florists would be doing similar. Um, hellebores, they are difficult to process. They do have a short, shorter vase life. Um, you need to practice your conditioning of hellebores to make them last. Um, but you can get a really good stem life for them. OK, and once you've got them established, they're quite easy. They self seed everywhere. And if you've got a shady area somewhere that you don't need to disturb much in the summer, it's well worth filling the under canopy, say, of a little spinny area or something with hellebores because um, they're very fashionable at the moment and very in demand. Another thing that I grow a lot of here because my I'm in a frost pocket, I'm in a wet valley. It's not easy in the winter to get a lot going, but willow likes damp soil and it doesn't mind the cold. So we grow a lot of willow here. Um, people are more and more looking like this past Christmas just gone everyone wanted to make their own Christmas wreaths because they've got a bit more time on their hands because they're working from home and it was just seen as something fun to do something just to cheer everyone up so the demand for willow for weaving Christmas wreaths was huge and I don't think that that's going to drop off because now if people know how to do it they're going to want to do that again next year year after the colors have been popular and the catkins have been popular. So we grow quite a lot of willow just for catkins. So the one you see in the picture on the PowerPoint, Mount Ezo, is a pink one, which you can get for February for Valentine's. And how nice is that to have pink catkins to go along with some forced tulips or narcissi for Valentine's rather than red roses. So, and my local florists are weaving 
dogwood, red dogwood heart. I'm making heart shape. You can't see me probably, but if I'm looking at the PowerPoint, my uh, florists are weaving red dogwood hearts to put into their bouquets as the back piece this year, just to get British flowers out there rather than red roses. Okay, so dogwood as well comes in all colours under the sun almost, and they're really well well growing as well as willow. I've got a link down there for you for um, a really good supplier of different colours willows. And now prunus, varieties of plums, apricots, cherries as well. They all flower early in the year, some later than others, but all can be forced. Um, so you can bring them inside. I've got behind me, you'll notice later, some apricot blossom, which I've brought in from outside. It takes a week in warm conditions to start to break bud and it's quite controllable because then you can move it into the cool. But one of the problems, well, lots of problems with this, expensive and time consuming to set up because it takes a long time to get enough trees into blossom to have enough to be able to just cut as much as you'd like. And once you've got those flowers into um, centrally heated house they don't last very long they open up a lot of winter flowers you bring them into the house they won't last that long having said that they are still very popular and versatile camellias i would love to be able to grow i'm in a frost pocket and i haven't got an acid soil so they do not do well here i grow a few in pots and i love them but i can't really give you any advice about how to grow them because i just can't keep them alive in the soil here to get them to cutting size. But I, from someone that does grow camellias for cutting, I've been given the names of a few varieties that are good. Okay, witch hazel, very good, very expensive to start off with though. Okay, but very much in demand this year. So I wish I had more of it. Um, I will look at investing in a few more trees, I think this year. Again, the viburnums, you can't go wrong with viburnums because they will grow everywhere and anywhere, tough as old boots. So always have a viburnum hedge somewhere if you can. Um, skimmia as well, really good, nice evergreen leathery foliage that lasts forever. And those, if you get the right varieties, you can get these wonderful red or pink buds throughout the winter. It's a little bit fussy about where it will grow. It does like, they always say, a free draining soil that stays moist. And I'm like, sorry <laughs> it's got to hold water but be, be free draining which is a bit weird it does it doesn't like to sit in water but it does like a lot of water throughout the summer so it's a bit tricky to get going but it's invaluable for christmas wreaths again florists love it another florist favorite the garia elliptica it's easy to grow but it's quite slow growing but once you've got it you've got it forever and you can get a very good price for a, a bundle of um, the garrier foliage. Winter jasmine, easy, flowering from November all the way through. Uh, why wouldn't you grow it? It's lovely. Okay, yellow, nobody likes yellow, but this year it's the Pantone, Pantone colour of the year. So it will take a while for that to catch on and filter down into the <laughs> British public. But one year is going to be a yellow year. Let's have some winter jasmine for when it is a yellow year because it's it's a really good plant. And again, with the Forsythia, used to hate this. Bright yellow, horrible, I always thought. But um, there's nothing as cheery as it in March. And the foliage is really good in mixed bouquets in the summer as well. So it's multi-purpose. It's cheap, it's quick, it's easy, it takes for cuttings. So definitely have some Forsythia going somewhere on the farm. Mahonia, again, mostly yellows. There are some orange and red flowered forms as well, but they flower quite late into the season and some flower throughout the winter. Um, they smell nice. They are prickly. Most are prickly. So they're not easy to use, but for wedding work, they are really, really good and they demand a very high price, same price as well. And if a bride has seen a wedding with Mahonia being used in it, that's what she wants. Okay. Um, and quince, I wouldn't be without Japanese quince because, or even just normal quince to be honest, but that's later flowering. Japanese quince flowers quite early in the season. This one does last quite well if you bring it into the house. It comes in 
pinks, reds, creams, whites, double forms as well. Um, and it's just a fantastic thing. It really brightens up a winter bouquet. And the white quince is very popular for weddings at this time of the year. And we, that's one that will flower from January onwards. But my, where I am because of the frost, I can't really get the really nice flowers till March because most of them tend to be a little damaged. Um, I've been buying white heather from Clowance. That is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And I think we should have more people trying to grow heather. That's all I'm gonna say about that because it's quite easy to grow. It grows to one meter in height. Um, tolerant of most soil types, some are just acid lovers, but um, this variety, the Dali Dale ones, will grow in a non-acid soil as well. And again, at Christmas, this was one of, because I've bought it in from Clowance, it's one of the mainstays of some of my winter bouquets. People really loved it. So I think, you know, why not have a look, see if you can get some to grow in the corner of your farm somewhere. Um, again, winter flower and honeysuckle, fantastic. Not a great vase life when you bring it into the house, but the smell more than makes up for it because it's very, very fragrant. Um, one of the best smelling winter crops. Alstroemeria. I've got mixed feelings about Alstroemeria because they are in every supermarket and they are cheap in every supermarket and we've got used to seeing them all the time but they are invaluable for the long flowering season and how easy they are to grow. Um, now Ben Cross of Crossland's Nursery has loads of really useful videos on how to grow Alstroemeria. They're well worth a look at. Um, I mainly grow species just because they're a little bit different, but I also grow white Alstroemeria because it's very good for weddings and through a mixture of kind growing conditions in the polytunnel and um, growing, well, ben, ben will show you how to do it if you look at the video, growing young plants on. So it grows, you can, it grows from the, split plants to reflower again quite quickly so by continually growing new young plants you can keep your flowers going throughout the season so it's worth it but it's really good to grow on if you're on a large scale otherwise just think about your own market are you a wedding florist are you needing something a little bit different then go for the species for varieties so how, how are we doing for time? We're doing quite well for time, that's good. We're gonna look at forcing bulbs now. So give me a wave if you tried forcing bulbs before, if you've done that before, on a, even on a small scale. A lot of people have done it on a small scale and you'll have noticed behind me today, I've got hyacinths, uh, paper white narcissi and anemones in flower that were forced um, for Christmas, but they're still going now, some of them. Uh, forcing's lovely because it's really easy with almost all bulbs to make them think it's spring by subjecting them to a period of cooling and then bringing them into warmth and light and they will think it's spring and flower. So how do we do that here? We have a cold store where we can put trays of bulbs, crates of bulbs in tea for the 12 weeks, give or take, that we need. And then we will bring them into um, a heated conservatory or the greenhouse, get them going. And again, I love them because if you're growing them on a small scale, you can bring them into the warmth to move them on, take them into the cold to slow them down a bit, and then sell them onto your customers as you need them and pick and choose the ones that you need to suit the conditions when you're selling them. Okay, so daffodils can be done like this on a large scale, but they need quite a long time cooling. But if you cool them, you can get them and then bring them into the warm, you can get them flowering, no problem at all in November and have them all through the winter. Okay, it's not really worth doing it for any other time of the year because we've got plenty of other flowers that are a lot easier and to for the rest of the year but it's well worth having Narcissi and Flower from November through to April. And again, some of the Tazetta 
nicely so like the paper whites they do not need the pre-chilling pre stage you just pot them off up somewhere in the dark just to get them started from their roots and shoots and then you bring them into the greenhouse sort of a month before you need them and then when the flower buds start to form you can bring them into the warm and force them on ready for cuts okay And again, variety selection also needs to come in here because there's no point just getting King Alfred trumpet yellow narcissi and spending all this effort just to get them flowering in November. That's a bit ridiculous because uh, no one's going to want them in quantity anyway. And if they did, they're not going to pay you very much per stem. So do always look at the higher value narcissi and the best way to grow them and we're going to look at tulips as well in a minute. In fact, any bulb at all, if I'm going to be forcing bulbs, I grow them in crates such as um, I've seen recently a chat on the Facebook group about mushroom crates and things like that. So vegetable crates or bulb crates. You can put a layer of compost on the bottom, lay your bulbs into them, layer of compost on the top, and then you can move them about into the cool then back out into your polytunnel, into your greenhouse. And it just makes it so much easier. And then when you're harvesting, you can pull them up, bulb and all, cut your flower off, put your bulb into storage or discard it, depending on what you're doing with it. And that's job done really easy. No digging, it's not very back breaking. Um, best way to grow bulbs really. Again, tulips, you can do exactly the same. We've got a lot of very good tulip growers coming back into the UK again. Some have never left, actually. They're just becoming more in the public eye, um, especially in my area in East Anglia. So we've got Smith and Munson and Belmont Nurseries who are huge scale, absolutely huge scale tulip growers. But there's no reason why you can't also grow tulips. The one thing I will say is Again, variety selection. Everyone is selling single tulips in reds, yellows, purples, whites, and they're the sort that you can buy from your wholesalers, your British wholesalers, as well as your Dutch wholesalers throughout the season. So go for something a little bit more different, uh, doubles, um, stripies, multi-headed, something like that will see you good through the winter. And these can also be forced so that you can keep growing them throughout the season. And again, we can grow almost any bulbs by forcing early on in the year. So anemones are really easy to get flowering early on. I've got anemones in the unheated greenhouse growing, starting to flower right now, but they will be erratic until March. And then I'll expect to get good crops off of them in March. Um, but you can also get lilies, hyacinths, irises, fritillary, oh, amaryllis. Am I'm rubbish with amaryllis. I have got some amaryllis flowering now, but I've also got so many blind amaryllis as well that um, that's cost me a lot of money, really, to get all those amaryllis bulbs and to get very few flowers from them in their third, fourth year. So, um, and they grow from seed quite easily, but it's seven years to wait for them to flower. So maybe you're better than me with amaryllis, but they're one that I will not be growing. <laughs> Sorry, thank you for shaking your head. They are one that I would not be adding to my forced bulbs for future production. A few just for me because they're so pretty, but not as a crop. But lilies, hyacinths, irises definitely will make it. Fritillaries, I have not tried yet. I have my first bulbs this year. My soil is very, very heavy clay here, so it's not suited to fritillaries really. But um, I've now started building a lot of raised beds on the farm and we're trying those forcing fritillary this year for the first year. I'll let you know how it goes. But the other things are they're all possible to get into flower for March. No problem at all. Um, hyacinths. So I've got some hyacinths behind, sitting behind me today that you might have noticed. Very short stemmed in pots for um, houseplants, which I sell quite a few of over the Christmas period. But you can get them with a much longer stem, so they're suitable for cut flowers by giving them an extra 
pre-chill so an extra two three weeks pre-chilling before you plant them up and then pop them into your polytunnel and you'll get a longer stem on those flowers that makes them suitable for mixed bunches to go with tulips and narcissi. Um, I think I've got a link on the last slide somewhere to how to do that, how to get good length on your hyacinths. Right, so I've done it a bit backwards because uh, we're thinking about spring flowers and winter flowers now. So that was mostly the spring and winter flowers, but some people are still cutting chrysanthemums unbelievably in the south from their polytunnels and my main autumn go-to crop is obviously going to be chrysanthemums because uh, they're wonderful there's loads that you can grow so many varieties it's just like dahlia so many varieties it's unbelievable um, that it doesn't matter that the supermarkets have cheap and cheerful chrysanthemums in year round you will be able to find something to grow that will knock the socks off of those um, in whatever colour or style suits you and your local florists. Um, so if you've only got outdoor growing space, you're going to be a little limited with these because they do, they're not frost hardy really. And after those first few frosts, you are going to have to have them under cover in polytunnels or under caterpillar tunnels so that you can keep picking. So then you will want to be growing your early or your intermediate varieties. But if you've got access to cover, then you'll be able to grow late varieties as well. Having said that, the early and intermediates are still going to be flowering for a long time under cover if you can bring them into a polytunnel. So with our chrysanthemums, what we do is we start them off same as dahlias, really, uh, and then plant them out in the fields just before the last frosts uh, grow them on the one thing that chrysanthemums really do need is good support and um, I think if you remember flowers from the farm I've written a thing that's on the blog flowers from the farm about the pinching to get sprays or pinching to get blooms um, and they will start flowering late August September for your earlies and then what you can do is you can dig them up, bring them into the polytunnel, replant them, and they will keep going in there. If you're gonna grow late, you might want to grow them in the polytunnel from the start all the way through. Okay. Um, yep, yeah, but definitely you do need some croissants on your farms. Now, Acidanthera is really great. Last year, we had it by the bucket full. Uh, and Forrest loved it. We were using it quite a lot in October and November. Um, but this year we have none. And so it's fickle. Um, next year, I'm hoping to have loads again. We will see, but it's very fickle. So it's very much dictated by the weather conditions and the soil conditions that you're growing it in. But it's cheap. OK, so it's well worth having some of that. Um, again, Hesperantha, which is a much nicer name <laughs> than the Kaffir Lily name that it's got. But that I've had growing in the polytunnel, I picked right through to December. And that made, I've, I only grow the red variety, but there are whites and pinks as well available. I grow the red variety because it's a mainstay for my Christmas bouquets. But I definitely will add whites and pinks, I think, to to that now so that's well worth having a look at um, it's also uh, a lot of the British wholesalers sell that through the season so if you can't grow it you can get it from people like Clarence as well reasonably cheaply the Cornish growers do grow quite a lot of it just doing a time check we're nearly there but the one thing every flower farmer in the UK really does need to do is grow some good foliage because everyone that goes into flower farming grows into flower farming because they want to grow pretty flowers and they forget in their first two years they forget completely about fillers and foliage and then every independent florist wants foliage in their florist buckets every wedding bouquet wants foliage in it um if you do a wedding you will believe how much foliage you actually get through doing archways and garlands and table decorations so definitely everyone needs to be growing good foliage. And if you're going to grow foliage, why not grow an evergreen that's really good to cut through the winter as well? So 
eucalyptus is still very fashionable and the forest I've spoken to say it's still going to be in demand next year the trend is for foliage that flows and moves so things like um, eucalyptus are really good for the winter I've listed the other ones that we grow or I would grow if I could like the pittosporum I cannot grow because I it's not hardy here and again the olive I can't grow olive because that's not hardy here but I get asked for it quite a lot by people that want it for weddings okay abelia fantastic not hardy here but the other things I all I grow either in the greenhouse or in the flower field um, and if you can get something that's variegated go for it because variegation everyone wants um, if you want to have a look at good foliage look at the Irish Green Guys website uh, they know how to market their foliage they've done a really good job with their product over the last few years they are always sold out by the start of December so that just goes to show you and their stuff isn't that cheap so there is good money to be made growing foliage if you can market it well and that's all they do they don't do flowers all they do is foliage okay and um, the links are there for a few things and also where to buy eucalyptus trees because I just think everyone should have some uh, a few more things that we're looking at this year that we are not yet growing and the, the no-brainer for me with the variety um, extension your season grow, grow dry flowers they've been huge over the past two years if you have the space for drying and storing grow dry flowers because they will keep you selling right the way through the winter I'm still getting almost daily emails and I sold out in December so I'm still getting almost daily emails have you got any dry flowers we need dry flowers I'm still seeing it on the florists forums people asking where can I get dry flowers from so we are not growing enough dried flowers in this country at the moment. So definitely put some of those in. Okay, I'm gonna go quite fast now, but um, if you are looking to extend the season just through growing the annuals that you currently grow, you have to look at cool flower techniques. And the lady that wrote the book on cool flower techniques is Lisa Mason Zeigler from America. She has a book, Cool Flowers, tells you exactly how to do it. It's not that expensive on Amazon. So if you're interested in that, I'll definitely get that book. And if you don't have a polytunnel, you can definitely make yourself a caterpillar tunnel or a low hoop house. So there's links there telling you how to do that. And we still, we've got polytunnels, we've got greenhouses, but I still use these to get my antirrhinums and things like that in flower a month earlier than they normally would be. So they're well worth doing. So PowerPoint's going to be there for you. Have a look. And like I've said earlier, when you're marketing, educate your customers. Tell them your stuff is local. It's environmentally sound. It's seasonal. It's exciting. It's the way to go. Once you've educated your customers, they'll come back year after year for your scented, wonderful, British grown narcissi and tulips that you've produced in December. So there's just a summary of what's flowering early in the season and a few useful links for you. Okay, and we're back. Right, thank you everybody. I'm gonna have a look at chats. Okay. Right, any questions? So we can all come off mute now, guys. Thank you. I have one. Um, Jane, you were saying about um, the support for chrysanthemums. What do you use? Because I um, I didn't support mine this year and they've all gone. All oh, the to place. stake them? To stake them individually? No. Uh, we don't stake them individually because we're on a really windy site and we're on heavy clay as well. I just cannot get stakes in the ground individually. It takes me too long. Yeah. Um, so I am very lucky that I'm married to a farmer who has a loader and he pushes fence posts into the corners of the beds for me. And we turn sheep wire on its side. So just fencing wire, livestock wire on its side 
and put that over the top for any of the taller, sturdier stems, such as dahlias and chrysanthemums. We grow them through the sheet wire. And he's really clever and he's done sort of like ratchet straps for me so that I can move it up with the plant as it grows. <laughs> so it's a bit of a pain because um, you've got to get under it to weed. And, but I prefer it to the netting because the netting just breaks my flowers off and I'm cutting the net in all the time and I'm getting in a tangle and this is big and sturdy and you can see it and it's never going anywhere not even on our windy site yeah that's what I was thinking um plan so it's good to hear that you're doing that so should be doing that anything else um yeah I've just put on the chat what about the weathering effect on outdoor flowers because we don't all have massive polytunnels and greenhouses. Yeah, um, it does depend on your site quite a lot. But one thing that a lot of growers do, I mean, I don't do this, but what a lot of growers do, say, if you're growing outdoor roses or something like that in the summer, is shade netting strung along over the top of the rose to protect from rain and wind. So that is one solution. To the weathering effect on flowers but as you've heard like my um japanese quince my flowers are no good because of the weather yeah. until march but i could if i wanted to put some shade netting over them or something like that to keep the worst of the weather off of them but it's it just depends on your site really i've got no easy answer to that i'm afraid thank you Any other questions or comments? Anybody got anything they'd like to add? I was just really interested in caterpillar. I'm oh, sorry. I, no, it was you, Fran. I was I was saying it was you. <laughs> All right, okay. About caterpillar tunnels. I'm sort of still trying to get my head around um, getting stuff into the ground for autumn over the winter. So I've got all these plants ready, really healthy that I, that I should have gone into the ground, but I didn't have ground prepared. And I, because I'm just a bit cautious and nervous about making mistakes with all this effort that I'm putting in and just wondered about caterpillar tunnels and how how useful they work and do they need to be double skinned because I've seen some double skinned ones and I I don't use double skinned ones I just use single skinned ones here but I'm lucky because I've got a poly a large polytunnel for yeah. the more tender things so what I'm growing outdoors under the polytunnels are just hardy annuals so things like Ami and Serenus, things that would almost be okay on their own outside. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. But yeah. you might have a few losses. So um, what I'm doing is in the autumn when I'm planting them out. So I get my hardy annuals like that started out in the greenhouse. I start sowing those in August. Then I'm getting them out into the field in September, oct early mm. October. And at the same time as I'm planting them out, I'm putting the hoops in, which are just made out of the blue water pipe, the yeah, hard PVC yeah. pipe on um, just a little bit of cane dug up the end of each pipe, putting that in at regular base spaces along the row and then setting all that out. And then when the weather looks set to turn for frosty or super wet or anything like that, I'll put the um skin over now some years i've used fleece and it's just rubbish it just blows yeah, away yeah. it lies heavy it rips it tears it's just it never it, i can't use fleece it doesn't work for me on my site so i tend to use polytunnel plastic right. instead and put that over but and the main issue with the polytunnel plastic is that it wets up quite badly inside especially mm. when you get those early spring days when it gets yeah. unseasonably yeah. warm and your crops, yeah. your antirhinums are already a foot tall and they are transpiring mm. a lot. And and so you've got to be quite diligent at lifting the size of the caterpillar tunnel the minute you get a nice day just to air it out. The same as with a poly tunnel, you're going to open those doors. And if you're lucky enough to have ventilation, you can mm. open the vents. Mm. The Would you grow ranunculus in a, in a caterpillar tunnel? No, all my ranunks are in the poly tunnel. But if I didn't have a poly tunnel, I would. Yeah. They, they, grow, they grow really well, Fran, in a, um, a hoop tunnel, and especially if you want them later as well. Yeah, yeah. If you don't need them early, then leave them and they can 
be later and they'll be fine. They'll be absolutely fine. Right. Okay. Um, Will it be yeah. too late to put them in the ground now if they're ready and ready to go, you know, Out looking strong, shall we say? Yeah. Or should Out I wait? <laughs> Outside they'd be fine if, as long as they're in, um, if you're covering them, so they've got something. Yeah. Oh, okay, right, okay. But they will be later. They will yeah, be, they will now. They will mm. be later now. Yeah, yeah I've, um, my first year growing relentless, I followed the florette method, uh, like many of us. And I watched Erin do her little video on growing Renunx and I put them all in my poly channel and I covered with a huge thick layer of mulch as if it was going to be minus 40 and I'm on a very wet soil they all rotted every single one rotted oh. and I was devastated so what yeah. I did was I actually did a knee jerk thing and went on um Palmer Gracie and anyone I could think of that had still got ranunculus and bought loads and loads just in knee jerk and planted them at this time of the year. And I, I had some wonderful, wonderful relunculus in May and June, which was quite quite a bonus, really. Right, <laughs> but, okay, that's yeah. worth knowing. Yeah, you've got to trust your conditions then, haven't you, your local conditions? Yeah. Yeah, they just, the, it's just the wet with relunculus, really, yeah. isn't it? Mm. I mean, I wouldn't mm. dream of planting them outside in my current field because it's underwater and they're not going to survive, but I could yeah. do them in crates. Yeah if I'd got them now, you know, and get a lovely later crop. Mm. Mm. So what's like anyone else growing right now? Is anyone cutting this week? What are you cutting? What flowers? You know, saying that, it's interesting what you were saying, because I've got loads of heather that I haven't even thought about cutting. And I've got, I've got loads of it, loads of it that's just looking pretty, really. In the garden. <laughs> mm. Oh my gosh! For me, it's stark so cocker winter box. Winter box. Yeah, because yeah, it's so fragrant. It's lovely with daffodils. Mm. No, I've got loads of dogwood, in. loads of coloured dogwood. That's fantastic. Yeah. Midwinter fire. Yeah. I've got the green one, and it really is lovely in a bouquet. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question in the chat box, um, Jane, from Jill. Mm -hmm. We have a look at the chat box. Uh, yeah, that's um, a good question, Jill. Do I multi? Yeah, I do plant shrubs um, in my poly tunnel because I'm in a frost pocket where I am. Mm. So I do actually have some pittosporum in the in the poly tunnel because I love it so much, and I wanted to see if it would survive in there. Um, do I plant with bulbs and other perennials? What combinations might work best yeah everything's multi-planted in there basically because uh i've paid a lot of money for that polytunnel space i'm going to use every inch of it. it you know it's a big investment mm -hmm. so very often i've got things like the ranunculus and butterfly ranunculus are growing underneath things like sweet peas that will later mm. on come through so baby sweet peas in there at the moment, they're not doing anything. They're not moving at all. They're just sitting there vegging out. But later on, where the ranunculus beds is, the back of that will all be sweet peas mm -hmm. so and things like that. Um, climbing roses I've got in there as well. So I've got an, an upper canopy, if you like, in the polytunnel mm -hmm. that is doing well. Um, jasmine in there because that's been much in demand by wedding florists this year and passion flower foliage what i'm saying about there's a big trend for um foliage that moves foliage that waves about a bit foliage that trails so those sort of things are well worth growing now you may well have a climate where you can grow those things outside i don't but jasmine and passion flower vine uh if you can plant them in a corner somewhere because they they've been very high demand this year and looks that trend looks set to continue so yeah if you've got a polytunnel do try and utilize the vertical as well as the horizontal if you can just, just i don't know if you can hear me but does that imply you're growing things in crates and moving them around it being that is to make best use of space in your polytunnel yeah, that really does make good use of your space because um, you can stack them. You can put them onto shelving if you want to, to, just to make sure you have to make sure you've got adequate light. Otherwise, they get too stretched. So don't 
pile them you know just on top of each other with only a foot in between them but you it's perfectly fine to leave them like that just for the time being until they are on the point when, once they've got a good bud on then you move them into the light so that you can um, get the right stem length on them but okay. you know you can you can and the advantage of them being in crates is you are really really busy when they've finished your spring flowers once they're done that's it you're the, it's gone mental on the flower farm you can just pick them up and toss them outside toss them around the back of the polytunnel leave them there they will be quite happy then you can deal with them if and when you get a free day and you think i'm going to sort out all those darn bulbs now but that means the space that they were in you don't have to dig it you don't have to weed it it's just now empty space and you can use it because those crates have gone so it's just a way of streamlining everything really that's really useful thanks any more questions i'm aware that it's we're coming up to five which is um the end of the session but obviously if you've got any more questions then we can take them we come to a natural end <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks so much jane really really interesting and thank you yeah thank you a lot of information so, in thank that. you yeah thanks so jane much. thanks for that mm. um so all that remains is to say, thank you everybody for you know taking the time to attend this evening. It's been a lovely seeing you all actually, seeing your smiley faces, and uh, and b I'm glad that we're kind of hitting the mark in terms of what it is that you you want to to hear about and learn about. If there's anything going forward, as I said earlier, please just drop me an email. If there's something that you think would be useful, then um, we can look at putting that on. Um, just to remind you, there is, if it's talking about polytunnels, which have come up a bit, there is um, a Navigating the Planning Process session on the 27th of January. So if you're thinking of putting up polys or you've got some up and you've got some issues around planning, then, you know, come along to that session. I'll be sending out the details. Um, and then we've also got a data protection session as well on the 3rd of February, which might be useful if you're looking at how you store your customers' information. Um, that's just a general kind of refresh uh, and then there's some soil health stuff specifically for, for flowers into February so again I'll send that information out to you all um, again thanks very much for attending and, and I'll say good night for now thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.